Okay, everyone. I am Gustavo Tolosa, and this is our live webinar for session two of the online book club. We are reading Own Your Health, written by Glenn Merzer. Just in case that you're new here, just a little bit about myself. You were may, may be wondering, what is, who is this guy? Well, I have been running um, health, plant, food, you know, a whole food, plant-based webinars for about six years now. I started uh, doing all of the webinars for Dr. McDougall. I have also done many, many, many webinars with wonderful Chef AJ, who is also included in the book here and with a lot of other doctors and dietitians and chefs. And um, I, I love, love to do that because I keep learning. It keeps me motivated and I feel like I make a little bit of difference in people's lives. But also you may know that my lifelong profession is a musician. This is a piano right here. I'm a concert pianist and professor and um, I love, love, love combining my two passions of music and healthy eating. And so that's one thing I do. I run webinars where we cook together. And then at the end, I do a, a little concert for you with uh, favorite classics. So, um, and among other things, but th those are the things that keep me very busy. I also have a whole food plant-based um, Airbnb, which you're all welcome to come and visit me. And um, I wanted to remind you to, during the week, if you cook something from the re from this book, from the recipes, to go ahead and send me a picture of what you cooked because someone sent me one and I'm going to show it next week. And I would love to show what you've made. And then if you want to comment on the recipe, that would be wonderful. Send me an email at... Um, my email is info at plantemus.com. Okay, and the only other thing I want to say is to um, please follow me on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, it just helps me to continue doing these free uh, webinars that I do. So without further ado, we're going to get started, and let's see if I can hear bring Glenn Mercer. Glenn, can you see, us, see me? Yes. Can you hear me? I can. I can hear oh. you. Did my image just go out? There I am again. Hold on. So, everyone, this is, I have the pleasure of introducing to you uh, Glenn Mercer, the author together with Chef AJ of the book. And uh, today we're going to cover chapters two and three. And of course, a lot of those two chapters is. Um, stories that you told us about you, Glenn. And I have to say um, that I just couldn't put down the, the book because uh, your stories are very interesting, uh, funny the way you write them. And uh, I don't have to tell you this. I'm sure you know it, but what a wonderful writer. You, you just make reading easy and fun, entertaining. So... Um, I'm just going to <laughs> I'm just going to um, uh, let you tell us a little bit about chapter two. Here is my story. So why don't you tell us in your own words um, your story? Okay. Well, my story is that I uh, grew up in a family with a lot of heart disease. Um, uh, didn't know my grandparents. They were dead before I was born, except one died when I was a child um, and a young child. And uh, most of the relatives, especially on my father's side, all the men died in their 50s. Uh, so I grew up feeling that in this family, I'll be middle-aged at 25 if I don't do something different. So uh, I don't remember if I read anything or just heard about the vegetarian diet. And uh, I heard uh, a hero of mine, the comedian Dick Gregory, I heard him speak and he was a vegetarian. And so I resolved to be a vegetarian 
uh, the first day at the end of uh, the first day of summer vacation at the end of my junior year in high school when I was 17. And uh, that morning I had an English muffin for breakfast and the phone rang. It was my old buddy Dave. And uh, I said, hey, congratulate me. I became a vegetarian. And he said, well, since when? And I said, you know, since breakfast. And he laughed at me. And I haven't had any meat since then. So that's 47 years ago. So I think it helped me that he laughed at me. Um, and, um, he himself went on to become a vegetarian about, oh, about 27 years later uh, after seeing the movie Chicken Run. He, he was just morally outraged at the treatment of those claymation figures. Um, and uh, then he finally, uh, he, he gave up fish after seeing Finding Nemo. So that was his route to a vegetarian diet. Um, and so I became a vegetarian, but when my aunt and uncle who were obese uh, worried about me and they asked me uh, where I'd get my protein, uh, I uh, came up with an answer off the top of my head. I said, from cheese. So I continued to eat cheese for the next almost 20 years, I think 19 years. Um, just in case I had made some terrible mistake of, of giving up meat and wasn't getting my protein, you know, just as an insurance policy. And then I started to feel um, some heart pains. It was like an electric shock near my heart. I must have felt it about a dozen times. I'd be walking and then I'd suddenly feel this thing and it would, it would knock me to the ground. And I didn't do what most normal people would do. I didn't go to the doctor. Uh, I just thought about it, and I said to myself, well, I gave up meat because of the saturated fat and the cholesterol, and, uh, and now I'm eating cheese, which is full of saturated fat and cholesterol. So I said, I'll just give up cheese, and maybe these heart pains will go away. And I gave up cheese, and I never had that heart pain again. So uh, I never went to a doctor, so I can't prove that that was the beginning of heart disease, but I believe that's what it was. And that was uh, almost 30 years ago, and I've never had any problems since then. Uh, and my health has remained good. Uh, as I say in the book, I go to the doctor just once a year for an annual checkup you know, to ask him how he's feeling, because I'm fine. Um, so Gustavo, uh, how much further should I go along than that? Should we get back into a dialogue here? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, uh, Glenn, if you could get a little bit closer to your computer, okay. we, could, we could hear you better All because right. uh, this, better? I, I think that's better. Yes, okay. it, um, it, it sounded a little bit far away, but it, we could still hear you. So um, what I wanted you to talk a little bit about because I thought it was interesting and funny, it's the story um, about what your mother told you when you told her that you were yeah. becoming a vegetarian. Yeah, well, that day that I told my buddy Dave that I was a vegetarian, later that day I told my mother that I was a vegetarian. And her attitude was very strange. She said, well, what took you so long to figure that out? And I said, well, what does that mean? She said, well, I was going to raise you as a vegetarian from birth. Um, uh, and that was my plan. But then the doctor talked me out of it because the doctor uh, told me that you wouldn't get enough protein and your bones wouldn't develop and your brain wouldn't develop. So I didn't want to take any risks. So I gave up on the idea, um, which means right away that there was a doctor who harmed me before I was born, which is a remarkable accomplishment. Anyway, so she gave up on the idea and she... You know, I grew up eating meat and going to McDonald's. Um, and uh, so I asked her, I said, well, that's very strange that you were going to raise me as a vegetarian because she's not a vegetarian and my father's not a vegetarian and my sister's not a vegetarian. So I said, why were you going to raise me as a vegetarian? And she said, because when I was pregnant with you, you felt like a vegetarian. 
So I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> yeah, that that is very interesting. So uh, and I, I think it's true. I think maybe she really felt something. You were meant to be a vegetarian. I was destined. <laughs> you were destined. Well, despite that doctor, life took you down the path and, yeah. and you became a vegetarian. Um, you know, one thing that also caught my attention in this chapter, number two, when you described those electric shocks that you felt, I felt them too. Okay. And I did. And it was... It's hard to describe because it's like for a minute you your breathing stops and you feel this fear, like there, there, there's something to, that something totally wrong uh, that they should not be there. And I, so I, when I was reading that because it's the first time that I read or hear somebody say that, and I never told anybody, but. I also thought of going to a doctor and that, but um, thank goodness I, I well I, I went, but I didn't say anything about that. And I also find found my way and eventually found uh, Dr. McDougall and many of the other doctors. Uh, and when I started the whole food plant-based diet, it just went away. So like you said, I do have the feeling that had I gone down the path I was, you know, on uh, about eight years ago or ten years ago, I really doubt. I, I have a doubt that I would be alive, because in my family, a lot of uh, people on my dad's side have, including my father, died of a heart attack, and um, even though I, I, I believe it was mostly. It was, I wasn't congenital or anything like that. I think it was mostly um, diet related. So, yeah. Uh, we when people, we, neither of us would be here. Neither of one. No, this this would not be possible, and I wouldn't be here. Um, so when people say that, you know, there's a, I'm you know in my family there's diabetes in my family there's heart disease and it is hereditary and I don't have a choice uh, I don't know I think it was doctor um, I now I cannot remember who it was but someone said in a, one of the lectures that I listened to um, that what was hereditary was actually the diet that they were eating that is passed yeah. on from generation to That's generation right. yeah. yeah. So, um, very interesting. Uh, Glenn, this is something that also interests me. It didn't interest me that much at the beginning of my journey um, through this way of eating. But later on, as I found out what you talk about um, here, I'm saying the page number for people who have the book. On page 22, at the bottom, you say that uh, UN's report say that... Um, the animal agriculture um, business, you know, um, produces more uh, like green gases than all transportation combined. And then later on, you mentioned how it actually, um, the World Watch um, report instead, you know, corrected that to even higher levels. Can you just say a few words about that? Yeah. Uh, the. Um the uh, UN FAO report, uh, which was, I think, 2004, maybe, um, initially pegged it at 18% of greenhouse gases from animal agriculture. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And um, then the World Watch did a study, and they pegged it at 51%, more than half of greenhouse gases coming from animal agriculture. Um, it's a complex thing to study because um, do you factor in, for example, if you didn't um, if you didn't raise forests uh, to to um, to have uh, animals graze, how much more oxygen would you have in the air from those forests? 
One thing that the UN didn't factor in apparently, and I don't know why, is animal respiration. And the, you know, you got billions of animals out there um, breathing, breathing out, uh, emitting carbon dioxide and methane. Um, one thing that bothers me very much, whenever you hear most environmentalists, most um, uh, people in politics who talk about climate change, how we have to address the problem, they're only going to talk about cars and transportation. They never talk about animal agriculture. And they only talk about carbon dioxide, you know, which we get from the burning of fossil fuels. They don't like talking about methane, which is partly related to fossil fuels, but it's also largely related to animal agriculture. Well, methane is initially up to 100 times as potent a greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. So why aren't we talking about the gas that's 100 times worse? And the answer is they don't want to address animal agriculture. They feel like, well, maybe we can have electric cars or we can have more fuel efficient cars, but we can't stop eating hamburgers. Well, of course we can stop eating hamburgers. We have to stop eating hamburgers. And there's really no way mathematically, scientifically, there's no way to reverse climate change without dramatically reducing animal agriculture. It just can't be done, even if everyone's driving an electric car. So um, it's the most important environmental issue, and it's the one that uh, politicians don't like to talk about. And if you've, if you've ever seen the documentary Cowspiracy, it's even environmentalists don't want to talk about because they don't want to lose their base of support. Yes, yes, I saw Cowspiracy. I recommend it to everybody here to see is cow, you know, and uh, yeah, as conspiracy, but, but Cowspiracy. And uh, yeah. It's incredible to see how these people react when when they're interviewed and they just stop talking and leave. Um, it's very disappointing um, because, like you say, Glenn, and it's not to be negative, um, but there really isn't. Uh, other doctors that I've talked to and people in science, they really don't believe that we can reverse this problem that we are having with climate change unless we do something we stop dramatically eating animals i don't think that we will ever have an earth where there is not one human being eating an animal but um, i just wonder how many people would eat animals if they had to do it the old way and go out and hunt for that pig or chicken or cow and then kill it and then cut it up and no, not many. <laughs> um, so hopefully we will stay positive and this will change. But it is very difficult because of the amount of money that is involved and power. Um, Glenn, you talked a little bit about protein. And uh, that is always a frustrating topic for me and for other plant-based people when when they have to attempt to make sense with other people that are not plant-based and they uh, think that we cannot, that we don't have enough protein. And you mentioned here how just about everything that we eat from an apple to a legume to a, even lettuce. I mean, any, everything has pounds of protein and you, yeah. Basically, when you're eating whole foods, you don't have to worry about these things. Now, it's true that if you ate only fruit, you would have much less protein than if you eat a more uh, diet that includes legumes. You know, so I certainly recommend uh, at least one or two servings of legumes a day. Um, but it, it, you know, if you eat a normal, um, what you know, the other side talks about a, they use the term balanced diet, and then when they say balance, they're usually including meat. 
Well, I'll use the term balanced diet. Balance it with some legumes, some fruits, some vegetables, some whole grains, and that's the right balance, those foods. Um, and um, if, if, if you don't have a weight problem, a little bit of nuts and seeds are fine, not too much. Um, and um, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to think about protein. I think that every doctor, every single one that I have talked to has uh, told me that they have never seen a case of protein deficiency other than in some places of the world where people actually don't have enough food to eat. Because if you eat enough calories, you are getting enough protein. And I think you mentioned that here as well. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I'm just going to remind everybody here that you, you are, it's, you're free to type questions here in the chat box for Glenn. Anything to do with the book or anything else. And I will read the questions to him or he can read them here. Uh, so feel free to ask questions. Um, let's move on to chapter three, Glenn. And uh, this is another topic that um, is frustrating because of the wonderful job that the uh, industry has done, the, the, the processed food industry, the meat, in, the, the meat industry, of confusing the public about what a carb is. And I love your comment of how an apple is a carb, and but also a piece of chocolate cake is a carb. And we could all agree that the apple is mostly water and fiber and carbs, but it's a good carb. So would you mention a little bit about Jane Brody? Because that is, that is so interesting. What you what you the way you write it. That's on page twenty four and I mean twenty five and twenty six. Everybody who if you have the book there, um, yes. Jane yeah. Brody has been the New York Times uh, science uh, personal health columnist for the last almost forty years, uh, and she wrote an article in twenty seventeen called "Unlocking the Secrets of the Microbiome." And in that article, she, she wrote uh, that a diet more heavily based on plants, that is fruits and vegetables, may result in a microbiome containing a wider range of healthful organisms. That's true and that's good. And then she says, uh, people interested in having a health promoting array of gut microorganisms should consider shifting from a diet heavily based on meats, carbohydrates, and processed foods to one that emphasizes plants. So she's telling you don't eat so much meat or so much carbohydrate or so much processed food, but instead eat plants. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. Plants are, are full of carbohydrate. I mean, there are some, a few fatty plants like olives and coconuts but even they have some carbohydrate and most plants are gonna be predominantly carbohydrate. So how could she possibly think that you should eat more plants but less carbohydrate? It's nonsense. Uh, but I'm, I, I take a guess at it in the book and my guess is that she is using the word carbs the way it's sometimes used to mean breads pasta, um, donuts, you know. So we, we think of those things as carbs. Um, and it's, it's, you know, not a fair use of the word carbohydrate because there's plenty of carbohydrate in, you know, apples will be 95% carbohydrate. Most fruits will be 90, 95% carbohydrate. There's carbohydrate in beans and legumes. There's carbohydrate in all plant foods, carbohydrate in salad greens. So um, why should we use this term carbs and then call up an image of donuts, right? Um, so what I think she was talking about is foods made from flour, bread, 
donuts, um, uh, you know, waffles, pancakes, um, and foods made from flour are going to be less healthy than whole foods. Some of them, like donuts, obviously are going to be very unhealthy because they're full of sugar. Some of them, like a whole grain bread, I eat whole grain bread, you know, if it's just a few ingredients, whole wheat flour or buckwheat flour or something, I'll have that. It's maybe not as good as eating a whole grain itself, like rice, uh, but I don't think it hurts me. Um, so, um, I, and I know Chef AJ doesn't eat flour, doesn't have flour-based foods. Um, so certainly, if you're trying to lose weight, flour, you know, flours are, 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 are grains that have been beaten and crushed, and so they're more calorie dense. Um, so if you're trying to lose weight, yeah, avoid bread. But if you don't have to lose weight, you can have a whole, uh, you know, I have whole grain bread, I don't worry about. Um, but, um, but I don't have donuts. I don't have, you know, donuts are made with sugar and oil. Waffles are made with oil. And I don't know, they may have sugar in them too. And I don't need anything like that. So, um, you know, you have to watch it with food and certainly foods that you get in the supermarket that have flour are often going to have bad ingredients. Um, so um, I have just a few flour-based foods, like a, the occasional whole grain bread. And other than that, I avoid it. But that, I think, is what she meant by carbs. But it becomes very confusing if you're using the term carb to mean something other than carbohydrate. You know, carbohydrate is, is the primary macronutrient that we need to fuel our cells. And the idea of trying to avoid it is like trying to avoid oxygen. It's insane. It's true. It's true. And... Um... Here we have a few people saying that we should, and, and I know that AJ does it, and, and then I started making the difference between saying complex carbs and simple carbs, you know. Even that, sometimes people have no idea what that means. So maybe another way I came up with is saying highly processed carbs, because the word processed sometimes clicks more, so, you know, um, a candy bar, you know, is highly processed and it doesn't usually have much fiber and water and it's fat and sugar. And unprocessed would be an apple, a potato. But um, it, is, uh, it is a shame that this word has become a bad word. <laughs> because like you're saying, our main fuel is carbohydrate and it really is and like dr mcdougall explains it really is like trying to stop breathing because it's like air for right. our body so here donna says where can i find research showing long-term success for those who eat this way and manage to maintain the weight loss well, I think PCRM on their website probably has studies that show that. Uh, Michael Greger has a website called nutritionfacts.org. Um, uh, I'm guessing if you yeah. just search under weight loss on that. PCRM um, is very good. If for those of if you don't know what that means, anybody here is Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And that's correct. And then nutritionfacts.org is another place. And um, you can find, I'm sure you can find there. I do have to say something that I, that I say um, sometimes at the beginning of a book club. And, and I think I mentioned it last week. Um, that is that not everybody is at the same place when, when they, when they're watching something like this or reading a book. And what I'm saying about that is that when I started, when I changed the way of eating, I was almost 80 pounds, eight zero, 80 pounds overweight. Well, I was obese. So 
and I would and I had gone to the 10 day living program that Dr. McDougall used to do in person. Now they do it online. So as you, many of you know, Dr. McDougall does allow some pasta and bread. Um, and he recommends that to, to, to use whole wheat. So at the very beginning, when I had so much weight to lose, just cutting all of the meat uh, products and all of the dairy, but still eating pasta and bread, not in huge quantities, but once or twice a week and whole wheat, allowed me to lose 40 pounds. So even eating those products. Now, at one point, um, I had to give up a little bit more of those because I wanted to continue losing and I lost 70, 75. But at that point, I stopped eating um, bread and, um, and pasta. But uh, I do have a tendency, I think that's true. I, there are people who have a tendency to gain weight more than others. And unfortunately, I'm one of them. And uh, what can I say? But um, Glenn, I just wanted to clarify that because um, sometimes when a new person wants to start eating this way, if you wipe out everything all of a sudden uh, and you say, you can't eat meat, you can't eat dairy, you can't eat, you know, oil, you can't eat bread, you can't eat pasta. And so the person really gets scared, like, what am I going to eat? So I think that's the brilliant part of Dr. McDougall's program that allows them to eat and to get in this way of eating. And then gradually you, you yourself start to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say that. I don't know if you agree. You don't have to, obviously. No, I, I do but. agree. I have one slight disagreement with Dr. McDougall, which is that he is more lenient about sugar than I am. He will sometimes say, go ahead, put a little sugar on your oatmeal if that helps get you to eat your oatmeal. To which I would say, eat your damn oatmeal without the sugar. Put some fruit on it. Why in the world? It's breakfast. It isn't dessert. Why in the world would you put sugar on oatmeal? Right. Because you start putting sugar on oatmeal, then you're going to put sugar in your tea. You're going to have to drink the sweetened plant milk. You're going to. Why do you want to feed that addiction to sugar? Um, so that would be, you know, we all revere Dr. McDougall for being a pioneer. And he's, God knows he's saved more lives than I have. So I admire him very much. I just, uh, I always kind of, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, negatively to hearing him say, go ahead, put a little sugar on your oatmeal if you have to. Don't put sugar on your oatmeal. No, you know, you can do, um, I used, at the very beginning, I used to put a little bit of brown sugar. But then, you know, I started learning and reading. And so just putting a, a few dates, maybe like even two dates that you chop, that is whole food, plant-based. And that will add the sugar that you need. Besides fruit, you know, you pile it up with fruit. You don't yeah. need the sugar. Yeah. So um, here Jerry says, what would you put on a slice of whole grain bread? Do you eat, you know, I'm asking now, do you eat it by yourself? Do you put tomatoes? Do you put, do you put anything on, on the whole wheat bread? Um, you know, I'll sometimes have a sandwich. I'll make a sandwich with um, tempeh. And the philosophy I have now, and, and this is a little bit related to the, the book Fiber Fueled by Dr. Will, how does he pronounce his last name? Bol, Bolshevich or something? Uh, the book called uh, Fiber Fueled. Um, his mantra is diversity of plants. Diversity of plants. The more oh, plants, yeah. Yeah, that's the more right. different plants, the better. Mm -hmm. um, so um, let's say I'm making a sandwich with tempeh. All right. You could put a little mustard on the bread. That comes from a plant. Nothing wrong with that. You could have mixed salad greens. You could have tomato. You can have onion. You know, so uh, you can have cucumber. So just pile on the plants 
And the bread may not be doing you any good, but I don't think it's, unless you're trying to lose weight, I don't think it's doing you any harm if it's whole grain bread. Or if you, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have it if you're gluten sensitive. Um, and, uh, but all those plants are doing you good. And the tempeh is doing you good. And it's all low fat. So um, that might be one thing I have on bread. If I'm just going to have bread with a, with a spread, I sometimes will have a spread that is olive pate, but it's made without added olive oil. So it's just the crushed olives. Maybe it has capers in it too. I don't know. But the, I know that that's not the healthiest thing in the world. But what I do is I just put it on very lightly, you know, a half a teaspoon. And so you train your taste buds so that just a little bit, let's say a little bit of sesame tahini or a little bit of olive pate, just so you taste it, but you don't put it on thick. You don't put on fatty foods thick. And that way you can have fatty foods, but you just have a little bit. So that's my method and I've never had a weight problem. Right, right. And we, again, we all have to learn. I mean, one of the things about this way of eating is that you learn so much about yourself. So just you, you learn what, um, for some people, you know, nuts and seeds is addictive. They cannot stop eating them. For me, for example, you can put a whole can there and it just doesn't call me. But you put bread there, and that's why I don't have bread at home, because they, if you put bread there, I want to eat it all. So uh, just knowing yourself as you go down the road of, of cold food, plant-based. And we have someone asking here, um, Glenn, does Glenn have hope that whole food, plant-based will be a more permanent, permanent way of eating or just another diet do you? Oh, well, it, it's, it's, it's the natural human diet. So it's, it, uh, it's not a fad, if, if that's what the question is about. I don't have any fear that it's a diet fad. Um, my only concern, it's like we're in a race. You know, we have over 7 billion people in the world, and we have this terrible problem of the world heating up and climate change. And... We have to make this change as soon as possible, and we have to make it yesterday, and we have to do it internationally, and we have to do it despite the fact that the scientists and the politicians are not emphasizing this. Uh, even the ones who understand the urgency of climate change are, are failing to address the leading cause of climate change. They're, they're only talking about fossil fuels. Um, so, uh, you know, LED light bulbs, which are terrific, but you still, while you're lighting your room with LED light bulbs, you need to be eating plants because otherwise the LED light bulbs won't make a damn bit of difference. So um, we're in this race to, to have a sustainable diet and, uh, and to have a healthier country. Do we really want to have a country full of lagoons of cow and pig manure? You know, just think about the people who live near the lagoons of pig manure. It's not a nice thing to do to this country. So, um, you know, we, we need a sustainable diet and, and, um, it, you know, sometimes you come across people who think, well, yes, if I eat beef, but only organically raised um, beef from, uh, you know, I try to avoid eating beef from confined animal feeding operations and that kind of thing. Uh, only free range chickens. Well, do the math. We've got 330 million Americans. If they're going to be eating animals three times a day, Everyone's going to have to have three cows in their backyard and two pigs and 50 chickens. It's impossible. The only way we can feed people the animal-based diet is with these horrendous confined animal feeding operations. It's the only way it works. And they're terrible for the environment. 
They're terrible for water. They're terrible for the air. They're obviously terrible for the animals. So we have to put an end to these CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations. And it doesn't help if, if you, you, you know, some people eat what I call happy meat from happy cows on small farms because we just can't feed the population that way. No, no. Well, Glenn, um, let's let's just do a little bit more of chapter three here because it really caught my attention uh, the title um, because carbs versus roadkill, and I was like, I wonder what he means by that. So hopefully everybody here has read this, but it's always nice to hear it said verbally uh, in another way or different uh, by you who wrote this. So can you tell us a little bit more about the roadkill? All right. Well, my point in that chapter was if, 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 if people uh, are going to um, deride healthy food for being, quote, carbs, if they're allowed to choose a word, carbs, that calls up an image of donuts, and then makes people worried about eating apples, you know, why don't we do the same thing and use the word roadkill? Because consider a squirrel that gets killed by a car on the road. Nobody would eat that, right? Who goes around eating dead squirrels on the road? But if you think about it, if you get to that squirrel pretty soon after it's been killed by a car, it would probably be healthier to eat than most of the chicken you'll find packaged in the grocery store. It's not that the squirrel wasn't raised in a confined animal feeding operation. It's going to be cleaner and healthier or less unhealthy than uh, the chicken and the beef that people eat. So why don't we call animal foods roadkill? You know, it's a nice term like carbs to summarize all animal foods. It's all roadkill. Um, and um, it's all equally unhealthy. And um, uh, I just think that as long as the other side is going to use this foolish term carbs to confuse everybody and, and, uh, and give a, a negative uh, opinion of fruit and vegetables <laughs> and the healthiest foods around, we should use the term roadkill to uh, when you're in the grocery store, that should be the roadkill section. Um, that's my point. Right. Well, couldn't be any clearer. And that was a wonderful, concise, but really wonderful chapter to read. And um, I don't know, Glenn, if you want to say anything else about, I have, I have a couple of questions, but um, anything else about the book or your collaboration with Chef AJ or anything else you want to say? This well, is this is the third book I've done with AJ, but there, there, it's a very different story on the three books. Uh, her first book, Unprocessed, uh, she wrote and she came to me for my help editing and revising it. And the same thing with her second book, The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss. She wrote it and she came to me for my help uh, to improve it. Uh, this is, and, and in both of those first two books, it was her story, her personal stories and her philosophies and her approach to weight loss. Um, it was all her, just my writing help. Um, in this case, it's my personal stories. I, you know, it's my, uh, it's my views, uh, but I came to her for the recipes. And, uh, you know, certainly nobody's better than AJ at coming up with recipes. So, oh, yeah. um, and she wrote a little recipe introduction to it. So uh, all three books have her recipes. All three books advocate the same basic diet. Um, and so I like to call it our trilogy of books. Um, and, um, and all three books tell personal stories, although the first two tell her stories and this book tells my story. Um, so, um, and my goal in writing the book 
and I appreciate your comments, Gustavo, but my goal was to write an easy to read book. You know, there are some classic books of plant-based nutrition, but some of them are not what you would call a beach read. You know, they're full of scientific studies and, you know, uh, they're not necessarily all easy reading. So I wanted to write a book that makes the case, makes the case with humor, makes the case in an easy to read way, and um, to hope, hopefully to help persuade more people and to um, really um, point out how silly the other side is. I mean, the other side, and I'm talking about the people who advocate diets of you know, animal foods. Uh, have they ever reversed heart disease? You know, have they ever reversed diabetes with people eating sausages? It's preposterous. So, um, you know, uh, I just think that the, the, the other point I wanted to make in the book, and we'll get to it in the in further chapters, is that the science is really settled. You know, we don't have to pretend that this is an open debate. Yes, there are people still arguing and pointing out alleged scientific studies arguing for the animal-based diet, but it's still, they don't have a case. And, um, you know, what they always do is the same thing. They, they set up a straw man and they say, in this study, we compared people on a uh, ketogenic diet versus a low-fat diet. And then you look at the study and their low-fat diet is 30% fat. You know, it isn't a McDougal diet. It isn't an Esselstyn diet. It isn't a Chef AJ diet. It's people eating standard American diet, but just not eating quite as much sausage as they eat. And I don't know how you do better on 50% fat or 80% fat than 30% fat, but I don't care. You do better on our diet. And they never do a study comparing their diet against our diet because they know they would lose. So they always set up this straw man of people eating a, you know, a diet, a low fat diet, people eating a lot of donuts, you know, and uh, that's not a low fat diet. Glenn, I have to ask you this question because every time I have a guest, everybody wants me to ask this question. So the question is, what do you eat in a regular day okay. and or uh, what are some of your favorite things to eat or recipes? Okay, a regular day, I often begin with oatmeal or uh, buckwheat or, uh, you know, some grain. But these days, especially since reading uh, Dr. B's book, uh, Fiber Fuel, I try to add as many plants to it. So why not have your oatmeal on a bed of greens and then topped with, with berries and then some cinnamon or other spices? So just think about the, um, the goal of having as many plants a day as you can, particularly low-fat plants, which are most plants. Um, so I might have oatmeal or buckwheat for breakfast. I might have a salad uh, at lunchtime. I might have uh, potatoes. I might have, uh, like I said, a tempeh sandwich. Uh, and then I'm blessed in the evening. My wife is a wonderful chef, really. Not a professional chef in that she never worked in a restaurant, but she's better than the professional chefs. And she makes wonderful meals. Uh, it might be... Uh, Oh, uh, a mixture of uh, lentils and potatoes and rice or, uh, you know, all kinds of vegetables, um, uh, you know, a, a curry, a, uh, uh, sometimes we have pasta, um, uh, sometimes she makes spring rolls and we have a, a more of a raw dinner. Um, so we, uh, we always have great meals in the evening, and I usually make for myself simple enough meals for breakfast and lunch. Um, and uh, for snacks, I'll have fruit during the day. I might have 
uh, you know, an apple and two bananas during the day or uh, an orange. Um, and uh, might snack on a cucumber or celery or something like that. So just, I think it's healthy to have the goal of how many plants can I eat today? And uh, anytime you're hungry, eat a plant. Yeah, okay, great, <laughs> great answer. Thank you. I find it very useful, at least to me, um, to make my own hummus so that I know that there is no oil, zero. And um, I put some spices in it and I can dip those vegetables that you're saying for snacks or put them in, in the bread to make this sandwich that is 80 percent, you know, plants. Right. And instead of mayonnaise using that. But um, good, good. So, Glenn, um, someday when I write my book, are you going to be my editor? <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> I just said that because someone says here, when are the two of you writing a book together? Okay, I don't know. Let's so, do it. <laughs> um, I can't help you with the music, though. I, uh, right, that's going to be... Now, I have this book. Yes. Can you just say a few words about this? That, that book, Off the Reservation, um, is the story of a congressman from Bloomington, Indiana, where I now live, who uh, runs for president. Uh, and, um, and it comes out in the course of the campaign that he and his family are vegans. Um, and in the course of the novel, um, he s sits down at various times for meals with his family, with his campaign manager, and every meal that he sits down to, my wife has the recipe at the back of the book. So it's a novel with recipes. Uh, so there are 20 healthy recipes in the book and they, they follow along with the story. Uh, and so it's a comic novel about a vegan congressman who runs for president. And um, it would be lovely if, if that, I actually existed and became president. Yeah, that would be. Well, you know, I've been traveling and, and doing, uh, but I haven't read it yet, but I will read it. And this is one of the bonuses that you are giving people yeah. when they send you the email. Can you just briefly tell people, because maybe they, they're not sure how okay, so the there, bonus. There are two, two bonuses that I'm offering. First, I've already, the first one I've already sent to many of your listeners and viewers. Um, which is uh, when you buy the book, either Kindle or audiobook or paperback, you just uh, send me an email with your proof of purchase to gmerzer -E at aol.com, and I send you a, uh, a carrot cake recipe from Chef AJ, a healthy carrot cake recipe, um, a vid video, a private video of AJ making the carrot cake recipe and 25 healthy recipes from my wife, Joanna. So that's just for buying the book, my show of appreciation. Um, the second is if you send me an email that tells me um, which chapter you like best and why, then maybe Gustavo and I will choose our favorite answer and I'll send you a copy, we'll choose a winner and I'll send you a copy of the novel. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. So Donna asked, "What foods provide the most satiety?" For me, you know, it's potatoes and sweet potatoes. Potato. But I don't know what what you think. Oh, I think potatoes and sweet potatoes. Okay. Uh, well, we agree on that. <laughs> I love love the Hannah sweet potatoes because they taste like like a cake to me is it, they taste like vanilla and they're creamy and i can't that that's my my go-to snack um yeah i love purple sweet potatoes no those are delicious as yeah. well yes yes well glenn this has been a wonderful hour together and uh i know that we will in in a, one of the other sessions we're going to have you and your wife together yeah. 
And next week, um, we're not going to say the name yet, but we have a celebrity doctor here um, as a guest. So I hope everybody's going to join. And um, that's next, uh, the next session. So uh, with that, I don't know if you have any final words. Otherwise, I will. Uh, I, can... I have the words. Thank you, Gustavo. And thank you to all your listeners and viewers. And um, uh, oh, one more thing. One more thing. Uh, the, the website of the book is ownyourhealthbook.com. Ownyourhealthbook.com. And if you go there, you can sign up for a new uh, health newsletter that I'm going to be putting out. So a free health newsletter at ownyourhealthbook.com. Maybe I can put that in the chat. Yeah, own your health. Let's see. Uh, we will put also your email address because uh, someone was okay. asking about that. All right. So own your health book. Um, and there it is okay all right well thank you glenn thank you very much and i um i want to make one quick announcement and that is that um i am Putting together, I mentioned at the beginning how I love to put together food and music and putting together a webinar for Valentine's. Well, it's going to be before Valentine's to give everybody the chance to make the recipes, but it's going to be, it's, going to, it's called uh, Love and Friendship because if, uh, uh, you know, everybody have a significant other or a friend and uh, it's to celebrate that with a chocolate feast, but it's all whole food plant-based and it's only for this special occasion, not to eat every day. But these are recipes that Chef Shada uh, Soleimani has and he's gonna do. And then I'm going to do, I'm gonna do a little concert at the end with some really, really uh, wonderful music. So just wanted to announce that that's gonna be on, on um, February 4th. And I'm putting a link here. Anybody who wants to register, feel free to do that. And um, thank you, everyone, for joining. And here, one more time, thank you, Glenn. And uh, I hope to see you very soon in a couple of weeks. I will. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, Bye Glenn.